Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this special event, uh, Growing a Resilient Future, Food and Farming in Manitoba. I'm Laura Rance, and I'm very pleased to have been invited to guest host this event for you this evening. In my day job as Vice President of Content for Glacier Farm Media, we spend a lot of time looking at the issues of climate and the environment and agriculture and food and how those things intersect. And I have to say, on a day like today, when it's so beautiful outside, it's very hard to be too concerned about climate change and global warming. And yet it is very real. I mean, when you think about the fact that this is March 18th, um, I think we have to accept that there are things happening in the environment and in the climate that are changing. And there are things that can cause a lot of crisis in our world, but and, that, and those crises will have impact on Manitoba farms and food systems, but it's also an opportunity it's an opportunity and a chance to restructure and reimagine how we farm and feed our province. Today, you're joining the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, the Manitoba Office, the National Farmers Union, the Manitoba Eco Network, Manitoba's Climate Change Action Team and the Winnipeg Food Council for a discussion on the future of food and farming in Manitoba. And thanks very much to those organizations for bringing us together about this. This is the second webinar of this series in which you will hear five diverse perspectives on what we need to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and make our food and farming systems more resilient. Today, I'm joining you from the Treaty One territory, the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota peoples and the homeland of the Métis Nation. The water we drink comes from Show Lake 40 First Nation and the hydropower that we enjoy comes at the expense of many First Nations in Northern and rural Manitoba. The people and the organizations involved in putting on this event today are committed to systemic change, to respect for the treaties and all indigenous nations and to real reconciliation. Just to give you a few housekeeping notes, the presenters are responding to the question what are the top three things that we need to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and make our food and farming systems more resilient? Participants who would like to submit questions, and I'm told that there's 165 people who have signed up to attend this, and I think that's wonderful. People can submit their questions in the chat box at any time. The Q&A will take place after all presenters have had an opportunity to speak. This event is being live streamed on Facebook on the Manitoba Eco Network Facebook page. It is also being recorded and will be uploaded to the Manitoba Eco Network YouTube channel and website after the event. So without any more delays, I'd like to get to our speakers. I'm just gonna quickly run through our speakers tonight, but I will introduce them personally and with a bit more detail as their turn comes up. But we're joined tonight by Asha Nelson with the Fireweed Food Co-op. Julie Price with the Northern Manitoba Food, Culture and Community Collaborative, Anastasia Fick with the National Farmers Union, Neil Galbraith with Keystone Agricultural Producers, and last but not least, Duncan Morrison with the Manitoba Forage and Grassland Association. So we'll start with Asha, who's Asha Nelson with the Fireweed Food Co-op. She is the projects coordinator for the co-op where she manages the supply side of their flagship food, food hub project, among other responsibilities. She sits on the Winnipeg Food Council and supports food security initiatives and climate organizing whenever possible. In all of her work, she brings with her a passion for food sovereignty, climate justice, and economic democracy. Thanks for joining us, Asha. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me get my screen all set up. Can you all hear me? Yes, somewhat. <laughs> um, okay, there's my screen. Um, yeah, so my name is Asha and I am the coordinator of Fireweed uh, Food Co-op. And we are a nonprofit community service
Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. Can everyone hear me? We can hear you. Sorry, it looks like I was signed into a, a work uh, um, Zoom account and someone just logged in and kicked me out. Um, so sorry about that. I am back. Um, sorry, I'll just repeat everything because I may have I may have uh, dropped out pretty early on. So yes, my name is Asha and I am the coordinator of Fireweed Food Co-op, which is a nonprofit community, ser community service multi-stakeholder cooperative. Um, our mission is really to reduce barriers to participation in the food system for producers and eaters. And our vision is uh, to build a resilient, democratic, sustainable, and just regional food system for all. Asha, sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we're seeing uh, like your presentation isn't fully open. It's like a part of your presentation with some, uh, yeah, it's not a, it's not a full screen. Oh, goodness. Um, sorry, everyone. I thought it was working. Does that work now? It's bigger now. So I think, yeah, just that, that looks better. Okay. Do, can you see my notes on the side? No, uh, it, no, we don't see your notes. Okay. Sorry. Hey, so I'm so sorry, everyone. Okay. So I told you a little bit about our co-op. Um, some of you may know us as the founders of the South Osborne Farmers Market, but perhaps most uh, notable these days is our most recent venture, and that is, um, sorry, let me, there you go, that is um, Fireweed Food Hub. So this project um, aims to help small ecologically minded farmers access a larger, more stable mark, urban market. And we do this by providing marketing, aggregation, and distribution services for local sustainable food um, to wholesale buyers, such as restaurants, uh, retailers, and in the future, hopefully large institutions. Um, and in doing so, we also hope to get healthy local food into the hands of more of our community by supplying to school lunch programs and hospitals, for example. So I was asked to speak to you today about the top three, three things we need to do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and make our food system more resilient. But in all honesty, I find that question really daunting. I think it's because I, I, I believe wholeheartedly that we need a really robust multi-pronged approach to addressing the climate crisis. Um, and that will in inevitably involve multiple strategies at all levels from the grassroots all the way to the global level. However, thankfully, um, you'll be hearing from a wide range of experts who can piece together what a climate resilient food system can look like. For example, I just wanna give a quick shout out to our friends at the NFU who uh, published an incredible critical report entire, entitled Tackling the Climate Crisis and the Farm Crisis, which enumerates very clearly how we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in the agricultural sector. So for this reason, because I am not a farming expert or a climate expert, I'm gonna hone in on my own area of expertise and what Fireweed is doing on the climate front, which can be best described as helping to build regional local um, food economies. So I just want, because I'm the first speaker, I just wanted to provide a quick um, overview of the context that I'm working in, as well as all of the speakers here today. Um, the agricultural sector is dominated by large scale industrial chemically intensive farms and agri businesses, which make it the second largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the province. But not only that, the style of farming can also lead to soil degradation, loss of biodiversity, loss of wildlife habitat, and polluted waters, all of which, which push our planet to greater catastrophic dangers. As such, it really does require to be it, it really should be a site of radical change if we want to truly tackle the climate crisis, but we do need an economically viable and just alternative if we're going to have any real success. At the same time, there is a growing movement towards regenerative, often smaller scale farming, which produce far fewer emissions, can help restore ecosystems and soil fertility, and over time contribute to carbon sequestration through soil tending practices. Many of us refer to this as local food, but I do think it is important to remember that not everything that is local is good for the environment or our communities. But nonetheless, I think it is helpful and to stick with this term for the purpose of this presentation. 
So while there is growing awareness and effort to purchase local food through direct marketing, such as farmers markets or community supported agriculture, it still remains largely inaccessible to the majority of our community, and thus only makes up 12% of food purchases in any Canadian city. And unfortunately, there is little opportunity to increase that percentage, unless, of course, we dismantle the underlying structures that create these conditions. But in the meantime, we need to build the necessary collective infrastructure and distribution channels to increase the market share of local food. This is where the Food Hub, our project, comes in, and it also brings me to my first point. So as it stands, small, sustainable farms spend a lot of resources to simply get their food to market. To direct market local food, you need a whole range of skills in marketing and business, time to manage all of those logistics, social equity to build a strong customer base, and most often English as your first language. Ne needless to say, only a select few can make a living and, ev and even often struggle to stay afloat. Our food hub, on the other hand, aims to collectivize the power of small regenerative farms so that together we can scale up the market for local food without individual farms necessarily having to scale up in an unsustainable way. We do this by collectively marketing our producers, aggregating their products so that they can together fulfill larger wholesale orders, providing a centralized warehouse for storage and delivery, delivering those orders. And in doing so, we take off some of those responsibilities small producers carry so that they can focus more of their attention on producing in an ecologically sound way, as well as create a market for a more diverse group of producers to emerge in the future. However, as with anyone working in this sector, there's a lot of forces that are working against us. Um, and we definitely need support from the government in order to make this project viable in the long run. For starters, we need to make changes to the regulatory environment um, to allow small producers to participate in larger markets, such as in gr larger grocery stores or even institutions. Um, for example, there's a lot of cumbersome regulations around um, that make it really difficult and expensive for meat producers to get their product into sold it for retail. Another issue I, I would see I see quite frequently is just that small scale local eggs are almost next to impossible unless to sell unless farmers have access to a grading station. We also need greater investment in collective infrastructure that increases our storage capacity and aggregation activities. In the same vein, we need support creating an extensive distribution network that either encourages producers to share driving to the city or create centralized pickup points. So there is less need for driving altogether. As you all know, our farms are spread out really far across this province and um, delivery is just a huge hassle for many of them. Social procurement, um, I believe there's also a great opportunity there for the local food sector and our food hub more specifically. This is where local governments add a social value consideration when purchasing goods or services. For example, what this could look like is that, you know, our municipal government commits to purchasing healthy local foods um, in, in any area that they, they require. Or at the provincial level, we could see uh, purchasing of healthy local foods um, in our public schools and in hospitals. These type of contracts could provide the consistency small producers need to increase their production or allow for new producers to enter the market. Okay, well, <laughs> there's something wrong with my presentation, but uh, the second point I wanna touch on, um, that's something many of us understand, but may not have the same, but may not get the same attention in discussions on the climate solutions is the importance of increasing the accessibility of local food. In, on, in all honesty, we won't receive public support for a local resilient food system unless the vision we're proposing addresses the immediate needs of our community. Plus, something to remember is that if half the population can only afford high, highly processed food from the industrial agricultural sector, how can we expect to lower our emissions in a significant way? As mentioned earlier, Fireweed hopes to get local food into areas where it currently doesn't exist, such as nonprofits and schools, which we hope can trickle down to our most vulnerable community members. We also, in collaboration uh, with Serve the People, which is a project of Mutual Aid Society, um, created a program called the Waste Not Food Box program as a way to divert food waste from farms and community gardens and provide local food for families in need. 
This program is all about community help and community and is very grassroots. Um, and in many ways has been successful, but at the end of the day, it's limited in what it can accomplish. For that reason, I think that we, uh, as folks working in the food system, uh, need to focus on bigger fights um, that truly tackle the root cause of food insecurity in a, in a serious way. So for example, we need to push for living a living minimum wage, um, join the efforts to support affordable housing, fight against systemic racism, and fight for subsidies to go to go to regenerative farms versus big industrial agriculture. Um, and this brings me then to my last point. So our organization strongly believes that building a climate resilient food system requires cooperation among not only our small producers, but others working in and outside the food system. Unfortunately, we can't always wait around for supports from government. As such, we need to establish a really strong, robust network of cooperation to build and push forward the climate resilient food system we envision. However, the unfortunate truth is many of us work in silos, which leads to both unnecessary repetition of work, but also competition among like-minded groups. So one of the best examples I can think of when I, when I talk about this is just the lack of collaboration amongst farmers markets in this city and province. There's definitely effort to share knowledge and resources, but unfortunately, it's still what ends up happening often is that farmers markets um, unintentionally poach customers from other areas of the city. And in doing so, it prevents uh, small far farmers markets from establishing and it robs that community of having a really important um, a really important like gathering place, as well as it takes away from producers, new producers in their efforts to, to reach a larger market. Um, so that means their producers are competing for limited spots in a handful of large markets. And we just in general don't really have a thriving local food system here in, in, in the city. But what if we came together and encouraged customers to shop at their local community farmers market? What if we had a unified brand and shared resources so that small markets could exist and there was more of an even playing field? I know it seems like a small example when we're thinking about something as daunting and all encompassing as the climate crisis, but I think co collaboration can exist at every level. A good first step is creating spaces to come together and share knowledge and ideas with one another. I think this panel discussion is a great example of that. Our organization um, has also recently formed a stakeholder advisory committee for our food hub, and we call it the Lateral Root Network. The idea behind this is that we bring community organizations, wholesale buyers and producers together to identify ways that the food hub can and better support them and find ways that we can together address larger system challenges. However, cooperation might also look like sharing resources and knowledge and just general support for the work that we, we are doing and, every, and others are doing. Um, so that pretty much wraps up uh, my presentation. But before I end, I just wanted to uh, provide you with a powerful image of how I think that can inspire us to come together and move forward in the wake of this climate catastrophe. So our organization's name was inspired by the fire we plant which often is the first to emerge in areas that have been destroyed by um, forest fires and clear cut. And when it emerges, it merges in these places, it helps to create a lateral root network that then helps um, build a really thriving plant, um, a plant community. Um, and I think that that really just symbolizes like what our food system can look like and how we need to, to move forward in a way that um, uplifts all the work that we're doing. So that's pretty much it. Um, if you'd like to get involved or get in touch, you can always visit our website, which is down here, or you can email me and my email is just there as well. But yeah, I would really encourage you all to become members of our co-op. Thank you. Thanks for that, Asha. Our next speaker tonight is Julie Price. Julie works for the Northern Manitoba Food, Culture and Community Collaborative. She has had the privilege of working in agriculture and community led development for the past 20 years. Believing in the power of centering community wisdom and a collaborative approach,
Julie gives thanks to the many people who have helped her learn and grow. Thanks for joining us, Julie. Hi, everyone. Um, I want to just send a shout out. Thank you to all the farmers in the audience. I see a lot of people introducing themselves as food producers and from being all over the province. Um, thank you. I, my background personally is, is my mom's from a small farm in southwest Manitoba and I was my grandpa's shadow following him around that small mixed farm. Um, and my dad was born and raised in a small fly-in community. At the time it was a fly-in. Um, Snow Lake before they had a road. My grandfather was there helping to build the mine. And so I'm a Manitoban. I have a degree in agriculture and a degree in natural resource management, but I, I really feel like my education started when I went to work. Uh, and I'm lucky I started in the charitable sector at first working for an organization that was focused on things like farmers markets associations and farm mentorship programs and holistic management programs. And then for the last um, 10 years or so, I've been working with communities in Northern Manitoba. And um, I would say my education began in earnest when I started working with them. So I will share my presentation here. I have a few slides. Um, Laura, could I get a thumbs up or something that says this is looking okay? Great, thank you. Okay, um, so I was um, I was working for um, smaller scale farm organizations trying to provide supportive supports, and then I started getting invited to communities in northern Manitoba, and realized that my education did not provide me with an understanding of what had happened to food systems in this country um, since contact uh, or or the first settlers arrived and how uh, Indigenous food systems in particular have been affected. So I'm really grateful now to be part of a collaborative organization, uh, the Northern Manitoba Food, Culture and Community Collaborative, a big name for a big group that does a lot of things. Um, but I think um, at its most reduced form, I can say that we are a really strong foundational brick to a Northern Manitoba food system movement that is happening um, with communities leading the way. So my goal is to just share a little bit with you about what's happening in Northern Manitoba, um, show the very direct links to climate and leave with a, a few ideas about how we can better support a really positive food movement um, that might become uh, more important as the climate continues to shift on this planet. So the collaborative um, mission statement is, is working in relationship. We work in very close relationship with our community partners for healthier and stronger communities in Northern Manitoba. Doesn't even say they work with have chosen to work on food systems issues. They are um, one of the most critically important issues connect, uh, affecting communities in Northern Manitoba. And it's a collaborative. So we're not an individual organization. We're made up, we're basically a network um, of invested groups. So it's a true collaboration. We have 14 funding partners that sit around the table providing money, but also providing their time, uh, in-kind supports, a lot of thought leadership and strategic direction. We are led by um, six Northern advisors, people from the territory of Northern Manitoba who um, live their reality every day and are patient and gracious and offering their guidance to us as we try and work in a way that really supports communities in this part of our province. We have five staff people. Uh, my colleague Alexandria Moody from this Chiasset Cree Nation, which is just an hour north of Thompson, sends her regrets. She had she was planning to be here tonight to share about what's happening directly in her community, which would have been awesome for all of you to hear her because um, these stories, I think, are always stronger when they're told directly by the people who are um, leading them and doing the work, but she was not able to make it. Um, and we partner with, we've partnered with over 60 community-led food systems projects over the last eight years. So there is a lot going on in Northern Manitoba um, that is very much about food systems and farming. And uh, what I've learned is most of the rest of our province and the country doesn't get to hear about this good work. Um, this is just a little diagram of how we we operate um, on the on the left. Uh, uh, 
what do you call it? A consultant drew this. They were trying to do a paper on how our model works. And so just to give you a little bit of context, like on the left hand side, you know, typically you have your funder or your government program. They spend a lot of time laying out their strategy and then they deliver programs to communities. Uh, I'm sure if you're a farmer, you've been had a lot of programs delivered to you or offered to you over the years. Um, what we try and do is center the needs of the communities we work with and listen to them, learn and understand like what their vision is for their food system and then figure out how to provide wraparound supports to help them advance that work. Um, and I have to give a shout out to my elders, my Northern advisors who have taught me so much um, and lead our team. So. So Fyra Blauskis from Poplar River First Nation, she's in the top left-hand corner. Becky Cook from Miss Pawsett Cree Nation, um, uh, the top center left. Uh, Dr. Marlon Cook, she was the first Indigenous physician in Canada, um, and she's also from Miss Pawsett Cree Nation, also known as Grand Rapids. Elder Carl McCorister from Peguis First Nation, a nation that has a deep, rich history of farming and agriculture um, and until they were forcibly moved off their lands. and. Now they are trying to reclaim their culture of agriculture through their food systems projects. On the bottom left there, you have Irvin Bigotty. He uh, is from the community of Leaf Rapids, Manitoba and grew up in a food and farming project and found his way in life um, from that experience of growing up um, kind of like woofing, I guess. It was like working on a, on a Northern farm. And then Elder, Hil Elder Hilda Dysart from South Indian Lake, also known as Opipiwan Napiu and Cree Nation. This is just a slide that shows all our partners. Um, a real One of the real goals we had with this collaborative was to try to bring support to the Northern communities. I had been working in the South. I had been working with farming communities and farm organizations across Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta. And I found there, it's not always formatted in the best way, but there were different supportive organizations. And when we started, when I started getting asked to come North and, um, help northern communities develop their food systems, I realized there was a, a, a serious vacuum of helpers out there that would know how to reach and work with in a good way these northern communities who are working on very similar issues to the southern farmers that I was partnering with at the time. So climate change. Um, if any of you have looked at a map of Manitoba recently, you'd recognize we have a giant province. Um, and what's ge generally recognized as agricultural territory is like that bottom you know, chunk of the province where the, the Great Plains um, reach up into Manitoba. And we have some of the most beautiful, best uh, farmland um, on this this continent. My, my, fa my family farm is near Pilot Mound, Manitoba. And, um, it's just amazing to sit and see the soil and the depth of it and the um, think of the millennia of time it's taken to build that beautiful soil and um, anyway the communities we work with are uh, the top three quarters of the province basically um, and like I said we've partnered with over 60 community-led food systems projects so one of the first things I realized being a southerner without too much awareness of the northern part of my province was that there's this thing called Highway 6. It's this long skinny highway that basically connects the south of Manitoba to the north. And it is a busy highway. It is full of trucks. And a lot of those trucks are hauling food and supplies to northern communities. So we all know that food miles um, add a carbon footprint to the food system and what we have in northern Manitoba is the extra length of trucking stuff even further north and often for a lot of our northern communities flying food in. Um, in addition to just the distance from the places that uh, most of the food that is eaten was grown um, is the vulnerability of the supply chains for the north. Um, there's not a lot of competition in terms of grocery stores. We have one very strong leader in grocering in the north, which is the Northern Store from the Northwest Company. Um, so there's not a lot of diversity and there's a lot of vulnerability to the food system in the north. When the pandemic hit, it was uh, immediate repercussions in the north. Um, you saw empty shelves, big lineups, and planes not being able to land, trucks not getting through to deliver food, and basically immediately going into a food crisis in the north of our province. So all of those things lead to um, the need to not just sort of keep things as is, but to try to address the system because in terms of its impact on our planet, 
there's a ton of CO2 that is being generated by moving food into these places and the people and communities there are not being well served by the current system. So that brings me to the work um, that we are part of. And that is basically understanding the loss of the robust food systems that were present in this territory of Northern Manitoba, like since time immemorial, and supporting the return of robust food systems. Um, I thought I could sort of share what communities are doing, but also start with a little bit of a 101 on why food systems in the North, some of the reasons why, have been so vastly uh, disrupted. Even as recently as 50 years ago, some of the northern communities were almost entirely self-sufficient with their food supply. Um, but there's been a lot of really, Canada doesn't have a totally rosy history in supporting um, indigenous food systems. Uh, and that's a nice way of saying it. There have been a lot of policies and put in place and practices put in place that have really intentionally severed um, indigenous people in particular from their food systems. So when um, when reserves were set up, there was a, um, a person, usually a man, called the Indian agent, who monitored everything that was happening on reserve in terms of economic development and food. And Indigenous people, even in really healthy agricultural areas, were kept intentionally at a subsistence farming um, lifestyle. So you take the community of Peguis, which was uh, working to get into you know, modernizing farming along with all of their settler neighbors. And they were literally disallowed from having equipment, modernized equipment and told, um, enforced that they had to start with hand tools. If you had a successful farmer who was a great cattle producer, which I'll lean on my friends at Peguis with a few more examples from them, uh, a lot of great cattle producers um, that come from the Peguis nation. And uh, they weren't allowed to have more than 10 head of cattle at a time. Uh, they weren't allowed to negotiate the sale of their own cattle. And um, a friend um, of mine from that community has just a vivid story of being woken up in the middle of the night by his own father and saying, Shh, come on, quick, quick, come downstairs. And he he went and at the kitchen table was their neighbor down the road, a, a, a white guy who was there to buy some of the cattle, the indigenous family's cattle. And they were doing it at three in the morning under cover of darkness because they were not legally allowed to, to negotiate that sale themselves. And um, the Indian agent basically controlled everything to do with their success or failure in farming. Um, we also saw food used as a weapon through residential schools. And, um, and a lot of the plants on the noxious weed list are really important food sources for indigenous communities. So there's been all kinds of things that have led to the um, erosion of what was a strong food system. But what, what I and my, um, my colleagues and the communities that we work with are learning together is there is a huge appetite for growing the food systems in Northern Manitoba and contributing to the economy of Manitoba, um, reducing the draw that Northern communities have on the health system, on um, some of the social services of our province. And there are some pretty amazing things happening. So that big, beautiful picture in the middle, those are folks from Opasquiat Cree Nation, which is nestled right next door to the Paw. OCN used to be on the deep alluvial soil side of the river, and then they were forcibly moved by gunpoint to a, uh, the other side of the river that where the soil had scraped all the, or the river had scraped all the good soil away. But they are also reclaiming their history of agriculture. They are starting slowly, but they have a big vision. Um, they have about 60 families in the community that work together through a number of large, like multi-acre community gardens. And they're setting their sights towards um, producing, to start with at least like all the root vegetable supply that their own community would need. And as the climate continues to change, they're seeing um, the extension of a growing season. They're seeing the ability to grow corn in this region. Um, and really looking at how can they create healthy, um, sustainable livelihoods um, that involve the food system and serve other Manitobans as well as their own people. On the left of that slide, um, that's Carly. She's in Churchill and she has um, 
she is the operator of she doesn't like to call herself a farmer but i think she's starting to own the title because she runs um she runs a hydroponic unit that produces like forty thousand units every three to four weeks and is when the pandemic hit literally began feeding the entire town of churchill their entire leafy green supply um that unit is housed at the churchill northern study center we also have um, communities doing all kinds of things around reclaiming wild harvesting and wild food systems, doing that um, with harvesting and sustainability protocols that have been passed to them by their elders and teachings that respect the lands and the waters. Um, so we see all of these big visions and um, energy ready to rebuild these food systems. Um, and op opportunity that's created through the shifting climate to grow uh, different types of things further north. Um, one thing that there is a huge need for, for these communities that we're partnering with is support. So they have typically not been serviced by uh, a lot of the, you know, Manitoba agriculture programs or um, technicians or um, extension agents when, when, they, when we had those. Uh, and they're turning to our group trying to find out like where can they get help support, uh, where can they learn. A lot of the communities we work with have interest in sending groups of young people to intern on farms so they can really get a good grounding in how to grow foods and different food processes. Um, so I think there's an incredible opportunity for partnership between um, farmers in the south of our province who are interested in building relationships and making new connections with indigenous communities in the north who want to um, really have have well educated people that understand how to how to farm how to run these programs um, and do it in a way that leaves the land healthy and um, in good shape i wanted to just show a couple other Julie, you've uh, muted your mic somehow. I know it said, I think, can you hear me now? Sorry, sorry, Julie, I'm not sure how that happened, but I did want to uh, jump in and just let you know that you're a little bit over time. Um, so I'm not sure if you can wrap it up quickly, yep. but I'm worried about the number of presenters on the call tonight. Sure. Thanks. I will happily wrap it up. So I just wanted to show you there's livestock being produced all through the north with a real interest to scale up. Again, learning opportunities there. Um, greenhouses, um, greenhouses going up all over the north, uh, horticultural production, country foods programs, um, and beekeeping. We have beekeepers in the north. Um, so in addition to the potential for partnerships with farmers in the south, I think is just the need to really um, do whatever we can to include northern communities in the support systems that are there and to, like Asha was talking about, build additional support systems for a strong local food systems system that is um, low carbon in its inputs and um, food miles are short, if possible, between where it's being grown and where it's being eaten. So I hope that just gives you a few new ideas about food systems in our province. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julie. We'll have questions after everyone's finished their presentations. So just save them or send them in on the chat and they'll be relayed on to me as the moderator. Um, our next speaker tonight is Anastasia Fick, who's with the National Farmers Union. Anastasia is um, an NFU member and national board member for Manitoba. She grew up on her family farm located on Treaty 2 territory on the eastern slopes of Duck Mountain. As a farmer, Anastasia is interested in a shift in conventional agriculture that would actually have a positive environmental impact on the ecosystem. She's determined to leave a positive impact on the planet and health of its inhabitants. Aside from farming, Anastasia is an artist, a translator, and a pilot whose practice focuses on planes, dimensions, and cycles. Thanks for joining us, Anastasia. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'll just share my screen here. And I will start my presentation. There we go. So yeah, um, thanks very much for having me. Um, yes, I am a uh, grain and oilseeds farmer 
um, in Treaty 2 territory, Garland, Manitoba. Um, we do primarily um, export um, the majority of our product. Um, but as I will talk about today, um, the system that we're currently in, um, in my opinion, isn't, isn't a sustainable one. So um, I'm, I have the point of view that we should be definitely shifting. I mean, an entire shift immediately is definitely not possible, but we should be looking at how we can shift to an entirely sustainable system now and set up the framework for that. Um, so with that, I'm also a board member for the NFU, one of two general farm organizations in Manitoba, along with CAP, who is also a presenter tonight. Um, yeah, so the three keys to a resilient and prosperous future for farming uh, include a virtually, uh, to virtually eliminate food waste, drastically reduce agricultural inputs, as well as the implementation of a Canadian Farm Resilience Aid Association. So um, a lot of the information that I will be presenting tonight will can be found in the 2019 climate reports called the Tackling the Fire Crisis and the Climate Crisis. You can find it on nfu.ca, as well as the Imagine If report, which was released today. Two fantastic reports that really go in depth about farming and climate. Um, another great resource is Farmers for Climate Solutions, which I was a part of. Um, you can go to their website to find out what they're doing and what they're proposing, how they're working with government um, to implement a good transition and for farmers um, when it comes to climate. So um, we are overproducing food. Oops. Oh no, how do I go back? Previous. Um, I don't know how to make that go away, but um, so it's um, preventing and closed chain prevention and closed chain loops, making donuts. Um, can you let me know if that's okay or if, or if that's there's something blocking the uh, title there? So what you can do, Anastasia, is stop your screen share and just start it again. Okay. I think that's the way to deal with that. Okay. There we go. So oh, prevention and closed chain loops. I'll just hide this. Um, we are overproducing food. Uh, this can be seen in the dumpster of a grocery store on any given day. Um, this is costing absolutely everyone in the chain, both economically and ecologically. Um, it's causing unnecessary stress on soils and it's a senseless energy loss across the board which is costing everyone, like I said, um, and it's a huge contributor to greenhouse gases. Much of this is because farming is focused on export rather than local markets, especially commodities, grains of sorts. Um, so there's a huge loss in transport, um, loss of energy, I mean, um, when and a huge production of greenhouse gas, just in that, um, but also in the overproduction of food. So what can we do about it? At a farmer and a distributor level, uh, we can concentrate on the quality, on the artisanal produce and um, products to sell locally rather than um, selling mass products to export um, to the other side of the world. We don't know who our, consum who our consumers, who the customers are. We, there's no more connection to the farmer. It's basically just something that you pick up off a grocery shelf and, and you know, you put on your plate and if you don't finish it, you just chuck it down the garbage because it doesn't matter. So this is causing a huge um, problem in our system. There's no more connection to, our, to the farmer. There's no more connection to where this food that we are ingesting has come from. And therefore there's no more connection to where it's going because it doesn't matter. Um, so local processing is also key to supporting local farmers. Um, yeah, at a consumer level, we can educate on proper storage and preserving food. Um, yeah, there's an, um, sorry. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, dedicating a few days a week to eating strictly local food, for example, within a 400 kilometer radius would drastically reduce that um, the the amount that we are um, importing on a on a long term level. So, for example, if we stop buying imported food, people are going to stop shipping to us, and then people will be forced to eat at a more local system. Of course, this isn't a completely practical thing, but it would be a huge way to reduce that loss. Also, let's start eating ugly food. There's uh, a, approximately 20% of, of um, produce is thrown out because it's ugly. Um, it's, it's completely edible. It tastes the exact same, but um, we have this, we have developed some kind of weird thing with aesthetic. So let's, let's take advantage of that. And, and by doing, by eating ugly food will in turn help save the planet. Um, getting local governments to implement intermediary, to, intermediary pro programs like linking grocery stores with restaurants to shelters and those in need. Um, so that those who are unable to afford healthy food, which is often more expensive than unhealthy food, will have access to it. Well, I don't know why this thing is there. Anyway, um, so how can we close the loop? We have, we basically have this open loop system at the moment. Um, there, all those nutrients that are coming out of the soil are not being put back. Um, we need to do this by, by basically by compost. All of this organic waste is going to the landfill, especially in Manitoba, there's um, no public compost system. Um, this something like this is vital, absolutely vital when it comes to um, replenishing nutrients to the soil. Um, if, if we did this, we would implement a compost system, for example, in the city of, not only in the city of Winnipeg, but in smaller local areas, which is, would actually be much easier to manage. Um, doing this, we could, you know, not only provide a compost for small gardens, but eventually, you know, um, make um, compost tea for farms. Um, we could replenish those nutrients taken from the soil and put them back into the soil. We could close the loop of the system. And by taking this, the, um, any, all of this organic matter destined for the landfill, taking it out of that system where we'll also be producing that methane that is being re, um, produced in the landfill. Methane is the second most potent greenhouse gas um, that results from organic waste and is completely preventable. So, I mean, there's a lot of programs that talk about capturing methane and all of this kind of thing, but all we need to do is compost to prevent this methane. And for, and there's actually a few programs around the world that have, that are actually producing fuel from waste as opposed to growing green for fuel, for biofuel. Um, a lot of people are talking about biofuel and growing grain to produce biofuel, but you're using fuel to make fuel, which is, it, it's kind of, it doesn't really make sense. But if we're using, uh, we're producing biofuel from this already food that is being wasted, um, you know, all of the, go to the, the uh, grocery store dumpster, for example, take this food and then use that energy, capture that energy to, to uh, make fuel. Um, we can, th this will be a huge energy loss and, and close the gap further in the system. So I hope everyone likes donuts. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen again. So second part is agricultural input reduction. Um, our goal within the NFU is to reduce egg inputs, especially nitrogen by 30% um, below the 2012, 2020 levels by 2030. Um, we would do this by um, implementing the 4R system, um, which is the right time, the right rate, the right placement, and the right product formulation. Sorry. There we go. Inputs. 
Um, yeah, so we would do this by using those four systems, but we would also be working with um, soil biology. So for example, using different crops that do produce uh, nitrogen nodules that do work with the symbiotic bacteria to make nitrogen. Um, and really um, taking advantage of those biological processes rather than um, the synthetic inputs that farmers have been so conditioned to use. Um, since monocropping basically teaches, leaches fertility from the soil, um, um, farmers are, have been conditioned to, to, into using synthetic fertilizer, which has gotten us into a very vicious cycle. Um, you know, using things like anhydrous ammonia, for example, is a very, very common source of nitrogen. It kills off much of the soil biology and leads farmers to buy even more nitrogen in the next cycle because the, the soil biology isn't there to replenish it. Um, so yeah, this has gotten a lot of farmers into a pickle, um, not only biologically, but financially, um, because the, the fertility is gone from the soil, for example, or a drastic amount of it anyway. So now they are basically um, made to keep, you know, buying these inputs, buying these inputs, buying these inputs, because they don't know how to um, recreate the biological um, systems again, so that it will replenish naturally. So yeah, nitrogen um, is a naturally, occur for those who are not farmers, <laughs> nitrogen is a naturally occur occurring element that has been manufactured using uh, fossil fuels and sold as an additive since the 90 1940s, spiking in the 1970s and, and going up further from there. Making um, farming more efficient, um, especially for commodity monocrop systems designed for export. Um, this was this was at a time when um, farming was made to move out of the local system and and made to um, for a commodity and to basically put us on an international level. Um, nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas a hundred times more potent than CO two, um, so it's it's a really really big problem. So since egg is, is the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in Manitoba and nitrogen is the biggest emitter in, in agriculture, this is a really big thing that we can do to really reduce our, um, our impact on, on global warming and on greenhouse gases by reducing the total amount of, nit of um, nitrogen that we add to the soil. So like I said, our goal is to reduce this by 30%. Um, Another thing we can do is mandate carbon capture and storage at nitrogen factories. Since they are made um, using um, fossil fuels, that's one thing that we could definitely do um, just in the process of, of, of making those fertilizers, never mind when they're put on the fields and are leaching out because you know they haven't put in, been put on at the right time or right rate, for, for example. Um, the creation of independent farmer controlled data platforms to enable farmers to adopt precision agriculture methods without sharing data with agribusiness corporations is also another um, really important factor when it comes to um, egg inputs. So the end goal is to transition out of a system that keeps us dependent on these costly inputs, both economically and ecologically. And finally, our third, um, third factor is the creation of a Canadian food resilience agency that is publicly owned. Um, this Canadian food resiliency agency would take the lead role in agricultural adaptation and emissions mitigation. It'd basically be the umbrella organization for all of these um, calls that we have any, any support that farmers need in a transition to agroecological practices away out of fossil fuels, out of um, you know, this um, basically carbon dependence um, could be handled by this agency. Um, the focus would be on soil health, soil testing, and any, any other um, processes we could use to um, just better our, our techniques and our practices. Um, they would hire and train independent, independent um, agrologists under this agency um, because um, right now, for example, the people 
who are prescribing the the um, inputs to us are also the ones selling it. Which and and if we do want to go to an independent agrologist at this moment, um, we have to pay. I think it's about five dollars an acre. So if you're a farmer who has about three thousand acres, it really adds up, and it's just not feasible. So. Um, we need this to be publicly funded so that we can understand what we need for our soils and how we can um, increase our soil health, increase carbon capture, and all of these things. Um, yeah, we would coordinate research for low emissions approaches, help preserve and restore wetlands and treat areas. Adopt best possible grazing systems for livestock, um, for example, regenerative systems, which um, Duncan, I believe, will talk more about. Um, advise and aid in the transition from conventional to agroecological agro farming practices. So, like I said, focusing on soil health and, and better net income rather than just on increasing yields. And that's a really key factor is that um, we need as farmers, we need to keep this um, economically viable because so many farmers um, are kind of in this frozen state where they maybe want to transition, maybe they don't just don't know how, but um, it's, it's really risky because of this kind of vicious cycle that I've been talking about, that people just don't have the capacity to, to make these decisions without um, having the resources. And it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's a quite difficult and, and it, it's a very scary thing for a lot of farmers because of their tight margins at this moment. Um, yeah. We're starting to run a bit long, so maybe. Okay, I will, I'm almost done. Um, so yeah, key, key to success is, is a easy process for farmers. Um, and the success of, of nearly every emission reduction policy and program requires the work of independent agrologists. Um, yeah, and then that's the, the end. If you want to learn more, this, these um, keys, for example, are on, in the new report. Um, and yeah, if you'd like to know more, please um, visit nfu.ca. Thanks very much. It's, it's really hard to cut people off when, when no they're problem. putting a lot of time into things. So, um, but we do want to give enough time to our other speakers. So um, thanks, Anastasia, for that. Our next uh, presenter is Neil Galbraith, who's with Keystone Agricultural Producers. Neil is um, on the Environment and Land Use Committee, and he's the chair of that committee for Keystone Agricultural Producers. He's also a District 9 director. He was raised on the grain and beef farm near Portage La Prairie and completed his degree in agriculture at the University of Manitoba. He's worked in the private and public agriculture industry for 23 years. And for the last 20 of those years, he and his wife also farmed grain and livestock part-time. In 2007, he began farming full-time and now farms with his wife and two sons near Minidosa. They grow cereals, oil seeds, pulses, and fall seeded crops and are planning to include perennial forages in the rotation. Neil is passionate about soil conservation and health. Thanks for joining us tonight, Neil. Have you got your microphone on? Okay, can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Okay. okay. Sorry about that. I did everything else, but I didn't uh, unmute myself. Now I gotta get the presentation back to uh, full screen. There we go. Thank you very much, Laura. And thank you to the Equa Network uh, for this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, the slides are showing okay, Laura? Yeah, they're, they're good. Okay. Good. Okay, so R and R Galbraith Farms. That stands for Roberta, Neil, and Ryan. And Ryan's our oldest son. And since then, Jason, our youngest son, has also uh, joined the farm. As mentioned, Roberta and I started part-time farming actually 35 years ago, and both of us worked off the farm and um, finally made our way to full-time farming in the last uh, 
14 years, I guess, for me and less for my wife. The picture in bottom right, the first one cut off is our youngest son. This is supper in the field, right after supper in the field. The next two are a couple of uh, retired guys that like to keep their fingers dirty and help out a, a little bit in seeding and harvest. The fourth person is a young fellow a neighbor who grew up, uh, his parents lived on a farm, but they didn't uh, grain farm and he wanted to learn a little bit about grain farming. My wife, Roberta, myself, our oldest son, Ryan, <clears throat> one of Ryan's friends. And so why are there so many in the picture is the older guys help us in the morning and afternoon in the busy seasons. And then the young two guys, the friends, they help us in the evenings and on weekends in the busy season. I think one of the things, we were a family that actually incorporated a few years ago, and we did that to help transition the farm to our sons. We, we felt from advice from accountants that that would uh, be a positive. We're proud that we are a family farm with four family members involved with my wife quitting her job here a few years ago. And so now there's four of us involved and, and we're really proud of that. So I'm here representing CAP and who is CAP? CAP is the Keystone, is an abbreviation for Keystone Agricultural Producers. It's Manitoba's general farm policy organization. It's there to provide a unified voice for farmers on agriculture issues. We represent 4,500 farmers, members in the province. We have 12 districts, 21, 12 districts across Manitoba. Um, in addition, CAP represents 21 different commodity associations. And what that means is they represent 21 different types of farms. We have a wide diversity of farms, but we also like society have a wide diversity in opinions on agriculture issues. So what we do is use democracy. Any ideas for policy come from our farmer members, what we call our grassroots. And we, they make up resolutions. We do get research, we'll debate those resolutions. We have nine policy committees to get in experts or other speakers so that we're not just looking within our farmer knowledge. And then eventually those resolutions are voted on and they're either approved to be part of CAP policy or they're defeated by a vote. So that's how CAF works and that's what I'm rep representing tonight. So this is a very important question. And I think when considering this question, it's important to mention there is no silver bullet or one size fits all or one answer to the question. And I think previous speakers have pointed that out that there's several different things have to be worked on. And just as each farm is different, the solutions will be somewhat different for each farm. There'll be some commonalities, um, reducing nitrogen, diesel fuel, things like that. But every farm is different. So there'll be some different solutions. And a lot of that depends on soil type, soil moisture, your length of growing season, um, climate varies across the province, the variety of crops that you're able to grow, are you using livestock production or not? And, and not to mention financial ability to change practices, as pointed out by the previous speaker, can, can be a challenge. So just a brief highlight of some of the changes and the good work that's been already happening. So environmental farm planning has been around since about the mid 2000s. CAP co-delivers this with the Manitoba Department of Agriculture. And what that is, is a voluntary self-arrestment, self-assessment of all the land that you own and rent and farmyards, water courses, water supplies, livestock facilities, um, topography, uh, where the water moves off your land, all kinds of things for agri-environmental risks, your water table and things like that. And then the farmer develops a plan to try to mitigate those risks. And since its inception, there's been thousands of Manitoba farmers that have participated in the EFP process. Currently, there's 1.6 million acres have an environmental farm plan associated with them. They are valid only for five years, and then a farmer has to redo them. Once a farmer has completed and the plan has been reviewed by an independent third party, the farmer can access 
what's called beneficial management practices. And this is funding on a cost shared basis for projects that can, some of them can be expensive to implement, some of them can be easy, but there's lots of good BMPs in there. The last point of what farmers have been working on more recently and has been mentioned already is the four R's of nutrient stewardship. Basically to optimize fertilizer efficiency and enhance environmental protection. And our previous speaker mentioned 4R means using the right rate or amount of fertilizer at the right time, in the right place in the soil with the right product or source. And all these are very important to making sure we're not having runoff of nitrogen or phosphorus or more runoff than there currently is and try to lessen it from what it is today. Currently there's 920,000 acres designated for our in Manitoba. So I'm gonna talk about three major, and I'm gonna stop there. I was asked for three possible answers. The first solution that I think CAP has come up with is more farmers paying attention to four R nutrient that I just mentioned. So I'll make that the four R's, the first nutrient solution. And then technology, techniques, and knowledge. I'll pick two more solutions out of this. Technology plant breeding is always important. Varieties that could use less inputs and still yield the same, maybe be more water efficient, or maybe be more, use nitrogen more efficiently or phosphorus more efficiently. There's also enhanced efficiency fertilizer. These are more expensive fertilizers that are coated to release more slowly um, and therefore not be so vulnerable to leaching or nitrous oxide emissions. And they're definitely valuable in certain situations. If a producer is already using their current fertilizer in a good manner, they don't always need these more expensive fertilizers, but they do have a fit in certain situations. The next point, equipment and machinery. Not only more efficient engines or even electric engines in the future, um, but bigger gains, I think, immediately can be got from sectional control on our implements to reduce overlap of inputs, whether that be seed, fertilizer, pesticides. Each section can shut off sooner. Now on square fields around Winnipeg, there won't be a big gain on this, but in the majority of Manitoba, our fields aren't square and we have wetlands and bush in them and stone piles and hydro poles. And going around these things creates for a lot of overlap. And there's been studies to show you can save up to 10% of, of the inputs. So that's good for the farmer and good for the environment. Um, and the next thing is variable rate technology. There's been a lot of hype in this over the years. There's been some growing pains in it, but I do believe by knowing our soils better and knowing our topography and how the water and nutrients interact, we can treat different zones in the field differently. And that's where variable rate comes in to lower inputs on lower yield potential areas like hilltops or lower inputs where the soil already has higher levels of nutrients like our low areas where there's thicker topsoil and use less nutrients there. The challenge is this technology is fairly new both sectional and variable rate and expensive. So it is quite expensive to get into so that, but I still think the whole equipment machinery is a is a is my second solution that I, I would propose for helping. The last one on there is alternative fuels. There's pros and cons to alternative fuels. I know um, ethanol and biodiesel are present already. Um, Many people think they're great, other people don't. Um, biomass in the future, I think, would be a, a big step in the right direction. And then under techniques, beneficial maximum practices, ecological goods and services. Last year, CAP, CAP did a research project on this very title, and it's all about improving biological processes and incentives for farmers to adopt carbon reducing practices. Our provincial government has provided some leadership with the GROW, Growing Outcomes in Watersheds and the Conservation Trust and private companies like the Weston Foundation has provided money and other private companies to ALICE 
alternative land use services in watershed districts. And what I think is really important about these is they're showing that the public puts a value on wetlands, bush, riparian areas, fence lines, natural biodiversity, and that they convey this and show this to farmers not to uh, push down those trees and not to work all these areas because it is more efficient for the farm with less overlap, but it's not necessarily good for the environment. Conservation tillage is about less soil disturbance. The more you cultivate soil, the more organic matter you break down and the more carbon you release from the soil. So things now also in the River Valley, heavy clay soils, this is very difficult to move to less soil disturbance, not this year because it's dry, but usually it can make their fields too wet to get on. So it's a lot harder for heavy clay soils. But the more, majority of the province is a clay loam to a loam. There's pockets of sandy loam. This is where no-till, zero-till, direct seeding can decrease greenhouse gas emissions from the soil. Next, crop rotation. Pulse crops. Things like field peas and soybeans, they make their own nitrogen. You can't get any better than that, I think. That'll help reduce nitrogen use. Forage crops, I think, are really important. Perennial plants, that's what the prairies were before we got here and broke it, they increase organic matter and diversity amongst those forage plants. And increasing organic matter 1%, there's a figure, and I don't off the top of my head, but it really increases the amount of carbon we can store there and not release. On top of that, perennial forages need less nitrogen fertilizer because the legume part of forages produces its own nitrogen, much like pulses. Grasses don't, but if you have enough legumes in there, that can be enough. And also there's usually less fossil fuels needed to manage perennial forages. So if you listen to me, you'd think the answer is to grow all pulses and forages, but there's always a problem. We all can't seed all our farms to forages and pulse crops, or we would oversupply the market. And as soon as that happens in a free market enterprise, you have price crashes and we all lose money. So I think pulses and forages are really important, but in a measured, in a measured amount. And so this is my third solution. And my final of the three is crop rotation and trying to, you know, I would love it if, if wheat and canola could make their own nitrogen. I know there's scientists working on this, but it's not an immediate solution. And therefore I didn't bring that up. Um, that's down the road, maybe 10 or 20 years, but hopefully we can get there. Emerging agronomic practices, um, these include cover crops in fall and spring, intercropping with two or more crops, more diversity, regenerative agriculture, rotational grazing, pasture management. I'm not gonna dwell on them because I'm pretty sure Duncan is gonna speak about a lot of that with his presentation. Last but not least, knowledge. Knowledge transfer is really important. The University of Manitoba, Agriculture Canada, Environment and Climate Change Canada, and probably others I, for, I don't, I'm not mentioning, are doing research and have been doing research into greenhouse gas reductions for the farm level. An example is living labs. Government is also, some of that is government, but they do research, they do policy to match that research and programming and hopefully incentives to encourage farmers to reduce their carbon footprint. Farmers peer to peer and neighbor to neighbor is really important. Um, that's how cons conservation tillage started in the late eighties, early nineties, and now probably about 70 or 80% of Western Canada has done that way. And that has been a big help. It's not a silver bullet, but it's been a help for soil erosion from wind, especially, and somewhat on wa and water erosion. There's still, too much water erosion and soil happening. So Neil, we lastly, the public yeah. is so important. It's very important. Public and farmer interaction, like tonight, we can discuss, and in the future, why do we farm the way we do? Why has it got to this point the way we are? What challenges do we have as a normal, modern, conventional farm? What challenges do we have to change and to reduce greenhouse gases? More importantly, how can the farmers and the public work together 
through discussions and build consensus on a, on a way forward. And with that, I hope I haven't gone over time and thank you very much and look forward to questions. Thanks very much, Neil. We have one speaker left tonight. We will be going a little bit over time, but please hang around. Um, we'll have some time for questions after Duncan Morrison has his presentation. Duncan is uh, the executive director of the Manitoba Forage and Grassland Association. He's worked with the MFGA's producer-led board of directors and um, a vast partner and producer network to position Manitoba Pulse, or Forage Growers Association as a leader on regenerative agriculture and collaborative efforts to farm gate based projects around healthy soil, grasslands and forage crops in Manitoba. So Duncan, um, you've got the next 12 minutes and then we'll go into questions. Thank you, Laura. Uh, it's very great to be here. Um, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here on my slides. Just hold on a sec. Um, let me just go back to present. Um, okay, hang with me. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you to organizers for including uh, MFGA um, as part of uh, as part of this great event. Uh, we certainly appreciate um, we certainly appreciate uh, Jeanette's invite, Lydia's referral, uh, Emily's hard work while we're here. Uh, congratulations to all the panel members uh, for your excellent presentations. I've learned from all of you, uh, and I think that's a very good. Um, very good indication of the quality of the work you're doing and the way you're presenting it. I just got a brand new laptop, so I'm not sure if uh, I'm able to um, um, actually, if you're able to look at me, but I'm gonna use my radio voice and give you my presentation as best as I can. As a producer-led checkoff group with 30 years history, MFG is collaborative by need and by necessity. Uh, we're not very big. Uh, however, we have been gaining a lot of traction uh, quite recently. Um, if you can follow the progression of the slide that's on the on the, on right now, from left to right, you can see us in a nutshell. We got healthy grasslands. Um, we have soils, which are both positives to the imager on the right, which is uh, um, you know water management issues that uh, could positively be impacted by both on the left. As I was thinking on the assignment, as you may be aware, MFG is one of the leading voices on regenerative agriculture in Manitoba. In 2018. MFGA declared our position on Regen Ag to support our MFGA producers who are interested in learning more and also keen on MFGA hosting an annual conference on regenerative agriculture. We've since held three annual conferences and they're a vital component of our brand. Uh, they're a key part of our membership drive and also our corporate support. So um, very important to us. Many of our MFGA members are working with di within different market type systems that support their other farm revenue streams from livestock and crop systems. We are fully and 100% so supportive to the producers in our network and their own farm gate decisions. Most of our crew do grow annual crops in some fashion. We are not anti-annual crops, we are pro-soil. And it's important to un understand regenerative agriculture is not one specific practice, it's not a formula. It's a variety of different practices that are applied in land management, whether it's farming, ranching, gardening, all with the intent of building up the health of the soil. So that's important to, to understand where we come at this, where our interests are. There are farm gate decisions around soil boosting regenerative ag practices. However, to the assignment tonight, let's dive a little deeper. From MFGA's perspective, more perennial based production systems may help farmers become resilient by cutting back on annual plowing, by planting more cover crops to plant to maintain the soil, through the reduced use of synthetic fertilizer and pesticides. And all of these have a goal towards boosting production with a small, smaller carbon footprint. From a GHG perspective, more perennial production systems may also help farm uh, become more resilient. The more farmers adopting ag practices to bolster soil health and help sequester carbon, we feel it's the better. Um, as I was prepping for tonight, I took a, a look at numerous publications and, and materials. I, uh, we would like to pass our MFG congratulations on to the authors of Manitoba's Road to Resilience, the uh, Climate Action Pathway. Any effort of that level and detail is tremendous undertaking. MFG respects the efforts within that report, as well as the work of the National Farm Union and Darren Qualman, and we uh, enjoyed his presentation uh, last webinar as well. 
More perennial based production systems may help farms uh, become more resilient via water management. This is a photo of the Brandon flood in 2014, courtesy of the Brandon Flying Club. So you can imagine that uh, someone's not watching the road while they're snapping pictures or there's someone with them, but you can certainly see the wing bar there. Um, we, st we stand a better chance of managing the water by managing the land. Wetlands, grasslands, healthy soils, riparian areas, all play vital roles in water management. The Manitoba Forage and Grasslands Aquanti model is a high-tech, high-definition water movement model that was designed to look at the role of forages and grasslands in times of flood or drought in the Assiniboine River Basin. A recent study using the MFGA Aquanti model funded by Manitoba Agriculture Resource Development recently in the Oak River area of Southwest Manitoba recently concluded that the natural landscape's features, that being grasslands and wetlands, were absolutely integral in years between extremes of flood and drought. And as we know the dry conditions out there right now, um, perhaps those, uh, those, those wetlands and grasslands are indeed buffering us um, in these times. There's more information available on that on mfga.net, our website. So if the answer MFGA says is more regen egg, more perennial forage systems embedded into farm plans, and it means better things for all of us, I guess we can all go home right now. But you know what, despite the rising wave of mostly peer-to-peer -peer reported farm gate success, including presentations at the United States Congress and regen ag practices included in section of the provinces of Manitoba uh, sustainable protein innovation strategy framework. And with the understanding of the assignment, how can I actually and accurately answer this assignment? Well, the timing is everything. Uh, the simple truth for all of us is the system is not broke in the eyes of many. In fact, Laura, our, our dear moderator, uh, in the Winnipeg Free Press, March 6, 2021, um, did an excellent article on, on some, of the, uh, some of the times that agriculture is in. The la latest farm income forecast issued by um, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada predicts 70% of Canadian farms will report positive net operating income in 2021. So to frame our MFG thoughts, I put our answers collectively into timing perspective of, of pros, cons, and future with respect to MFG's focus on producers, soil health, and water management. This is Ryan Boyd. He's one of the most visible faces of the regenerative agriculture uh, community here in, uh, here in Manitoba. Ryan's U of M uh, educated, and he's also a recent Nuffield scholar. Um, producers are gaining more and more knowledge um, around our board. Um, we have 15 members there, all have degrees, uh, most of them from University of Manitoba. Um, producers also have a bigger profile and they have a bigger network. This helps inform peer-to-peer -peer interactions, grazing clubs, conferences and tours, which are more prevalent than ever. Add in major corporation interests such as General Mills who are active here in Manitoba and also Cargill, um, who are active stateside um, as well as uh, across some areas of the prairies. And the Manitoba Sustainable Protein Strategy um, that includes plant and animal protein via regenerative management practices. And including as well, recent, recently Manitoba's Conservation Trust, uh, which created a funding specific project category for improved soil health on new, um, new acres around soil health minded regen practices, such as cover crops to keep uh, a living root in the ground for as long as possible. The cons, well, we're mostly a glasses half full type uh, organization and our photo library uh, does not um, contain a lot of bad news. We're usually happy about most stuff, but this is the kind of stuff that does uh, kind of make us scratch our head. Uh, the collective impacts of land not absorbing water. Now this is just one dirt road crossing in the Assiniboine River Basin. It was taken in 2016. What might um, interest you is this came from October of that year. Um, it's just down, uh, it's just down a little, not too far from uh, Hamiota in the Assiniboine River Basin. But in some ways, uh, the refusal of some uh, in the system and of the system to accept that maybe the field by field approach of some regen ag farmers in the way they prep their lands to absorb water via the way they do or they are doing things expands way outside 
field by field, yield by yield equation. At some point, the sum of all parts, including yield versus collective benefits, needs to be entered into the mix. And we agree it needs to be done properly. MFG fully understands that the non-peer reviewed anecdotal claims of some pro-regen egg proponents rankles the science community. We get that. We have key re researchers and supporters in our loops. We know scientists are trained classically to always err on the side of caution with our results and not over interpret what they see. That's part of their profession. That's part of what makes them special. They do not want as a community to be providing any sort of false notions to anyone that might not be substantiated. So to get by that, we think that there is a call for more um, science around regenerative agriculture to take in some of the landscape effects and to champion farm gate decisions around regen and soil health practices. And with that comes a host of other benefits, including water infiltration. Now the timing, the big question is, and to this, this particular audience, is what we are doing currently doing the best way to do things? Are we ensuring a bright future ahead for Canada that blends the economic titan that is the agriculture industry with prosperity and the ability to produce the food the world needs while enhancing our own environment and propelling our economy? This is where the resilience questions asked tonight finally come into perhaps proper context. As I wrap up my talk, you may have noticed that I did not dive into the rapidly moving, super complex, highly variable, still developing carbon system too heavily. Here's MFGA's take on that. By focusing the farmers adopting ag practices to bolster soil health and help sequester carbon, the more the better. By focusing on soil health, regen ag practices and water management that provide layers of community resiliency, valuable ecological goods and services to society, MFG producers are doing just that. And we are ready for the system that, that is eventually selected or activated for the benefit of Canada and Canadians. We're ready to work on behalf of MFG producers. And with that, thank you. Thank you, Duncan, that was wonderful. Um, so we are just at 8.30 but we do have some questions and um, they've been posted on the, um, on a document that I have here. It came, they came in through the chat line and if you have more questions, please send them in. Um, here's a question for Asha. Would you please expand on your comment that not everything local is helpful to address the climate crisis? Yeah, I don't need to go too far into that. What I meant though, is like, if you think about it, um, you know, pollution occurs locally, doesn't mean it's good for, for the environment. Um, there's local can also mean really big and can be mean um, really far removed from the community. Um, but I think that we use local uh, interchangeably with like a vision of a more community driven food system. So I think we just need to be careful in that use of the term. Okay. Um, now for Julie, have you looked at the food production systems used in Northern and Eastern Siberia that support some significant populations throughout the Siberian region? Um, I can share uh, that there is a growing interest to understand what's happened in other Northern and similar climates. Um, the communities that we're working with are, are definitely interested in developing or redeveloping the food systems that really makes sense for them with their local um, resources and opportunities and not building food systems that are really reliant on shipping up a lot of resources. Um, and I, I don't know specifically, it just totally open to sh uh, receiving any information that there is to be shared. We have been learning from Northern Siberia on a specific type of beehive structure that is supposed to be better for overwintering bees in long cold winters. So that's about as far as we've got with that kind of sharing. But I think the more that we can learn from similar experiences, the better. Okay, thank you. Um, our next uh, question uh, refers to um, the National Farmers Union calling for a National Royal Commission um, to call witnesses under oath to testify to investigate and recommend changes for a more, more robust food system. And the question being asked generally um, is, 
will our government carry out this needed Royal Commission investigation into why our present system needs some changes? Um, just wondered um, if I could just ask each panelist to give a yes or no. I mean, is that something like, it, do we need a Royal Commission on, um, on the food system in your views? Just a, a quick canvas of the, of the panelists. Uh, Neil, what's, what would you say? Well, I guess if the public want it, then we need it. Con yeah. Consumers uh, should have, the, have a say in if they feel we, we need it. Asha? Yeah, I feel similarly with Neil. Yeah, Julie? I'm not familiar with all the different implications that a specifically a Royal Commission would bring. I'm uh, heartened by the National Food Policy Council that's been set up and we clearly need more attention to our food system across the country. So whatever levers could be pulled, I think are needed at this point. Anastasia? Yeah, I, I think so. Similarly, I think that uh, our food system needs to be reformed and, and whether that's a, a royal commission, you know, commissioned by the government that does that. Um, yeah, regardless if we, the end results in reform. Yeah. And Duncan? Yeah, I think for sure. I think some of the earlier uh, panelists um, that spoke to that, um, I thought they were spot on. I, I think we're always interested in, in more um, you know, more efforts or more ways to, uh, to make ourselves more sustainable, for sure. Yeah, and, and I guess when I read this question, my, I'm wondering, there's a, two different approaches. We've got the Food Council, Policy Council, which is more of a community-based organization that's been appointed by government, and the difference between that and a royal commission, which would call witnesses and, and undertake a, an investigation. So I'll just leave that with the audience. Um, for Neil and and or, or Anastasia, just uh, just a question about the the amount of coordination or collaboration between the National Farmers Union and Keystone Agricultural Producers regarding crop rotation. Is there any common discussions taking place? I'm not aware of any. That doesn't mean there isn't some, but I'm not aware at this point in time of of. Uh... Uh, co-meetings uh, talking about crop rotations. No? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I mean, I think that we're definitely open for collaboration and, and power in numbers. I think if we collaborate together to to um, do things to advance, um, you know, addressing climate change, it, it'd be fantastic. Um, our wetlands have been drained, which is leaving less room for necessary natural environment benefit. Is it reasonable to depend on temporary grant payments to hold on to remaining wetlands? Um, the drainage in 2020, the Minidosa rains washed out drains and roads, and that contributes to downstream effects. So I guess the question is, you know, do we need a more robust uh, system, I guess that relates to environmental goods and services, but a more um, structured uh, way of supporting uh, that environmental management as opposed to temporary programs. Um, I'm going to throw that your way, Neil. Yeah, no, that's a good question. And there is, they're called conservation agreements. They're a lifetime, uh, Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation, uh, Nature Conservancy Canada, I believe Ducks Unlimited. I'm not sure about DU, but those first two for sure will do what are called in perpetuity, but um, which means infinite uh, protection of wetlands. So there are, and there's starting to be more money for that from Conservation Trust and the GROW. I think there needs to be more yet. Probably need to look to the private and public sector and not so much government. But uh, no, it's important to uh, that 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 it is happening and needs to happen more. Anastasia, what, what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, you're definitely right, Neil. And it also need, there needs to be more incentive for farmers. I think that a lot of farmers right now, um, they care about their fields and they uh, and the long-term effects don't really um, bother them. Well, I mean, don't, not really bother them, but they're not really thinking in the long-term. So, I think that there needs to be more incentives and more protection, um, more rules in place, um, because kind of right now, it, it, people are doing what they want with their own land, which they have their own right to do that, obviously. But yeah, there needs to be more education, I think. 
Here's a question for Duncan. What's your experience with civil pasture in regenerative agriculture? And do you think the adoption of civil pasture could be part of growing a resilient future in Manitoba? Hey, thanks. That's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, it's certainly talked amongst uh, our board a lot. Um, we recently held our Regenerative Agriculture uh, 2020 conference online. Um, we had it four Thursday nights over the month of November. And one of the keynote speakers was a gentleman by the name of Mark Shepard from Wisconsin. And Mark spoke directly to, uh, to that particular, um, to that silver pasture. And uh, actually, in fact, at mfga.net is a recording of all our presentations, including Mark's. Um, so if you're interested in that, Aaron, please feel free to, to go and look it up. And I will tell you that there's a lot of interest around it. Do we think? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we think it, it definitely has uh, more to learn about um, for us here uh, being Manitoba. Most of our producers are in southwest Manitoba, um, but definitely it is a topic that comes up constantly as, as something in the future. So for Neil, uh, how does CAP envision the future of the rural landscape in Manitoba with most farmers nearing retirement? Land prices increasing by 4% per year, farmers continuing to drain their lands, tear down shelter belts and plow perennial pastures. It's kind of a heavy question, um, but uh, is there a, a, a um, how does CAP look at these issues in the, in the context of a, of a resilient farming system in Manitoba? Yeah, no, that's, I'm glad to answer that. It's a good question. Um, we're positive about the future, CAP is. Um, one area we probably don't agree with the NFU is that we don't think there's a farm crisis out there. In fact, since the, the last commodity super cycle from about 2008 to 12 and uh, grain farming anyways, I won't speak for uh, hog farming or um, beef cattle have probably been better once it took them a lot of years to get over BSC. But anyways, we don't think there's an income crisis in, in farming. Um, it, if the land price is going up, that's driven by farmers. Uh, it's farmers wanting to expand. Our whole system since World War II has been with producer, with consumers wanting cheap food, we've gone to specialization. We've gone away from diversification and gone to specialization. Whether that's right or not, it's not for me to say, but um, drain, tear down shelter belts, there is that going on. Um, some CAP members, uh, like I told you, there's great diversity. And uh, so some CAP members believe they should be able to do whatever they want on their land. There are provincial regulations on draining land and, uh, and those should be adhered to. Um, so there's challenges there, but a lot, of the, a lot of farmers are worried. I don't wanna use the word scared, but worried. What we call some, one of the first presenter called it industrial agriculture, I'll call it modern conventional agriculture. You know, that's 95% or more of, of, of the agriculture in the province. And so a lot of them are scared about what will happen to their income if um, they're forced to do this or forced to do that. For example, I could put 10% of my land into forages, but if I make, just break even on those forages, well, then I've lowered my income 10%. Well, do people who are earning, earning a wage in, in Winnipeg, a nurse or a teacher, do they wanna take a 10% pay cut? So these are the kinds, when you're, when you're your own business, self-employed, there are more challenges than just um, saying, yeah, I'd like to do that. You have to financially figure out, can you do it? And, and like the Duncan's thing, regenerative agriculture, I think is great, but what are we gonna do with all those forages? Are we gonna have all of Western Canada have grazing cattle? Well, are the, are the, is the public gonna want all that entire fermentation? So there's lots, it's complicated stuff, but I, to answer the question, there's good points in there, but we're still positive about the future for farming and our resilience, our ability to change and adapt for the, for the environment and the country. Thank you. For Julie, are CO2 additions used to enhance greenhouse production 
at uh, in the north or in uh, we, you spoke about the Churchill greenhouses, but I'm just wondering um, throughout the north. Not yet. Um, there people in northern Manitoba are pretty early in their learning curve and learning how to just manage sort of basic um, starter greenhouses. But there is vision for especially using um, local available resources that can boost production and making communities less reliant on like bringing up fertilizer is not a long term goal. So looking at techniques that are um, uh, environmentally friendly and available locally and increasing productivity is the direction that they're trending. Um, just needing to build the capacity and experience to get to some of those, to applying some of those technologies. Okay. Um, the UNIPCC SR 1.5 states that we must eliminate fossil fuel use by 2050. Bill Gates says it would be, would be hard, but still possible but just making fertilizer more efficient will not get us there. Why do we not have a plan to be compatible with these objectives? Um, who wants to take that one on? Any, any takers? Um, I, can, I can start. Um, I would say that we need government support. I mean, to be able to transition to any of these, you know, sustainable practices, we need a, a framework. And without governmental support, what are we supposed to do? Mm -hmm. So this is why we've been putting so much pressure on the government to put um, money into, you know, something such as a CFRA or putting money into egg support so that we can transition into these sustainable practices. Without it, um, like farmers aren't willing to take the, that financial risk on their own. Yeah, change is risky for sure. Um, here's a uh, question on organic agriculture and how can certified organic agriculture play a role in the climate crisis? Since it is the only federally regulated sustainable agriculture standard, I imagine it could play an important role in facilitating change. Uh, who wants to start with that? Anastasia, do you want to take take a run at that? Um, yeah, I would say, that, I mean, Organic certification has its pros and cons. Um, with organic, you, like it's it's really hard to transition from conventional to organic systems because you there's a three year gap in which um, you are using organic practices but you're not being paid organic prices. So it's it's a really big financial hit for somebody and they have to be really really well prepared. Um, and then then after it comes to it, you know, organic farming isn't easy either. Also, organic farming uses a lot more mechanical tilling. So even though you're not using any kind of inputs, you're still tilling the soil and you're using a lot more fossil fuels to work the tractors. It's, it's a lot more intensive. Um, so, I mean, there's no real, you know, solution. I would say that um, agroecological practices um, are, are a lot more open. There's no specific certification for agroecological, but if we could all as farmers move towards those practices, we will all come at it like a wave and all transition together out of, out of the um, detrimental to a sustainable, to a, um, a system that is working with nature rather than against it. Well, with that, I think we've run through the questions that we have and it's been, um, a great evening. Um, we, we did have some really great presentations tonight and people have stayed with us for, for a little bit longer over our appointed time. And I wanna say thank you to everyone. And I especially wanna thank the panelists for putting the effort they put into bringing some very divergent perspectives together on food and farming and building a more resilient system. So with that, I'd like to uh, 